Welcome to the Time Has Come podcast. My name is Graham Wardle, and today I have one of my oldest friends, Peter Harvey, on the podcast. We went to film school back in the day, and he's also the man, the producer, the get-her-done guy who made the whole Mongolia trip happen for me a couple years ago when I went there to shoot some additional footage for Heartland. I can't thank him enough for making that happen. He's got a lot going on. I'm so excited to have him on the podcast today because we get to talk about all things film, flashback to going through film school, and learn a bit about what drives him and what lights him up the most. Uh, At the end of the podcast there, I ask him a really fun question. So I hope you enjoy it. And now the time has come for us to welcome Peter Harvey to the podcast. Peter, how's life going? Life is going pretty well. Currently based in Toronto, uh, I have kind of film around the world, but that's kind of where I keep my belongings. Your home base? Yeah, in a loft there. And then, uh, yeah, I, you know, for me, it's all about the project's heart. If I read a project and it's amazing, it's something that I want to, to join on to. And a lot of times that means uh, friends bring me really cool projects and I get to work with friends. My And travel the world. Yeah. It's not a bad gig. Kind of my goal in life is to make films with friends. Okay. So that's like what I always strive to do. If I really love a project, I'll figure out a way to be on it. Uh, and if I don't, I'll pass because it's just like, <laughs> it's a ba- It's like your baby, like you're, yeah. you're on it forever. So it's like, you know, especially when you're producing it in 20 years, you're still doing things with the it's project. It's like a child. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so it's like, you really got to love it because if you don't, yeah, you're in for one. <laughs> so what got you interested in film? Were you always into film? Was that something that came about later in your life? I started making movies when I was 11. Okay. Um, you've met some of my like old time yeah. friends, Sandy Tyler and uh, Jesse Payne and Roman Zabilka and, and those guys. And basically I would always be behind the camera and kind of directing them doing these weird, funny spoofs. Uh, you know, we'd make James Bond spoofs. We'd make all these weird things. And we probably started that, yeah, like around 11, 12. And I played a couple years of junior hockey. I had one more year left. And I got into Capilano University. And so when I got into the university, I had to make the decision, do I keep playing junior hockey or do I go to this film school, which was relatively hard to get into. There was, I think, 500 applicants that year. And I think they took 120 of us um, in the first year. So it was one of those things where I just kind of had to be like, am I going to make the NHL? probably a long shot. Like I was a rather small defenseman. Mm. I think I was the, you know, me and another guy were the smallest guy, smallest D men in our league. And just, I had to make that decision and I chose film school and really in the first two years met people who I'm still collaborating with to this day. Uh, football was my thing. I thought I would play uh, football until I got some concussions. And I was like, no, football's not, (laughs) football's not, in the cards for me and then I went to film school and that's where we met but when you you said you were making films uh back in the day with your friends was it just fun for you or was it was there types of stories that you've always wanted to tell Uh, you know it started as fun yeah and and um you know we just started making these kind of like joke projects but I soon kind of realized that I loved being behind the camera Mm. deciding what shots we were doing I really loved camera operating And I, you know, in first year university, when they asked, they're like, who wants to be a director here? And everyone put up up their hand, put up their hand, (laughs) uh, except for me, it was like me and another person. And they're like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, camera operating. Like, I love it. Yeah. Um, and I still do to this day. If I, if I kind of want to try to work back to just like camera operating Rob Grant's movies, if I can do that, that'd be, that'd be ideal. Rob Grant's a director who we worked with uh, in film school and after film school. He's the director of uh, Harpoon, uh, which has 96% on Rotten Tomatoes. Hey, nice. Yeah. So, yeah, I kind of wanted to be a camera operator. And then you actually convinced me to co-direct with you in second year. And that's kind of when I got my first taste of directing. And I'm like, ooh, I like this too. And then I kind of fell into producing, production managing, line producing, producing, Uh, And I was really good at it. So when I moved to Toronto, I just kind of excelled in that. Mm. But I've always considered myself a filmmaker. 
I don't just consider myself uh, a producer. So right. it's like I'm good at producing, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to write something. That doesn't mean I'm not going to direct something. In your heart, you're a storyteller. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like if I write something or I find something that I feel is perfect for me to either direct or produce or do that, it's like I'll kind of find my way for that project. Well, we watched a film last night that you suggested that I thought was pretty fun. It was called The Wizard. I was looking up the credits while we were watching last night. Yeah, The Wizard came out in 1989, and it's definitely something I watched as a kid in the 90s and was like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, when we watched it last night, we're like, oh, yeah, this is why kids like this movie. It's uh, yeah. it's a kid show about uh, kids running away to a Nintendo World Championship yeah. where you could win 50000 Like... That's just fun. I remember being told that it was produced by Nintendo because it's basically a giant ad for Nintendo. Yeah. And so I looked it up last night and there was a couple companies that I didn't recognize that I'm like, oh, maybe they're the parent companies or a production company they set up. But yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to do more research. But I feel like Nintendo had... They definitely had a hand in that in yeah. some way, like financing or something, because uh, those cer certain scenes were like all about playing Nintendo and how you couldn't get away from it. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, it's funny how they were showing how addictive <laughs> it is. <laughs> Cut to now, kids are... Addicted. Uh, addicted and have issues, so yeah. Some of those films I remember when I was watching when I was a kid are what made me want to get into film today just by how much fun I had and how those stories like impacted my life. I remember watching films as a kid and being like, oh man, like even in that, the dynamic between what was the kid's name? The Freddie, uh, what's his, his, the actor's name? Oh, uh, Frankie. Fred, Fred Savage. Fred Savage. So Fred Savage and the girl have like that kissing scene. And I remember watching movies as a kid and then there'd be like the romance and then the kiss and I'd be like, my heart's pounding. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so intense. It was like a way for you know, you to experience things that were to come that you're like, I don't know what this is like. And that's one of the things I really liked about film when I was a kid was that it was a, a window into a world either of a life experience or an adventure that you either wanted to have, that you might have, that you're going to have in the future. And I just wanted to know for you, what were some of those films as a kid that really impacted you or that really made you excited about life or just about filmmaking in general? Well, one of them, you know, is still one of my favorite films today is is The Goonies. Right. And The Goonies. And it's funny because it's like, A, that was amazing, like, s story writing and screenwriting. Wasn't and Shia LaBeouf in that? No. No, that was uh, the... No, so it's like the people who are in it are incredible. It's like Josh Brolin, a young Josh Brolin is in that. The lead actor is is um is Sean Sean Aston yeah uh, Lord of the Rings yeah Lord of the Rings and and Rudy and like but yeah the cast in that you look at the cast and you're like oh these guys are incredible and you know again it's like I think why they stuck with us all these films these coming of age kind of movies from back in the eighties and early nineties they're all these crazy adventure stories where they're all trying to get something and there's bad guys who are all adults who are after <laughs> them. And you're like, you know, as a kid, you're just like living in this little bubble and like you always have these kind of adventures in your own mind. And when you're kind of making up imaginary worlds and, and playing. So these guys, like especially the Goonies, captured that perfectly. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure Spielberg produced it. Yeah, the Goonies was good. I think there's a card at the start of that movie yeah. where it's like St Steven Spielberg presents, and you're like, what? What? Yeah, lots of lots of kids' films I remember watching as a kid, and like, yeah, like you said, like adventures and just like exploring life. And the one we were watching last night, and they're they're on a road trip trying to get to this uh, video game championship, and they like <laughs> they do some things that you're like, that would never happen. Like that's that's totally a kid's fantasy of what a road trip is like. How they were always they were hitching perfect rides everywhere they went. Well, you know? not not necessarily perfect. The first ride, oh, that's they, true. the that's first true. ride they took, they got robbed. <laughs> that's true. You know, so it's like, but you are right. It is it is very much like a fantasy of, yeah, an ideal situation. When you see the big bad bikers roll up, he immediately is like, "Oh, great! I'm gonna get robbed again." Right. That's and true. And then cut to you know them all getting a ride 
you know, on separate bikes ripping down the road. And it's yeah. like, that's pretty cool. That's pretty but cool. it's also like, I don't know if that would happen. <laughs> Do you have plans or, or have you ever uh, participated or made any, you know, kids movies like that before or thought about that or had any scripts come across your desk? I haven't had like a really good kid adventure script yet. It's funny though. There's a lot out there because we all grew up in the eighties and there's a lot of people who want to, to remake those and, and kind of have, films like that so I have read a couple but they haven't been good enough for me to decide to jump on and produce them yeah but you would though if if something was good enough you'd jump on and definitely do like a kid film yeah for sure it's you know there's a saying in the film industry it's you know never work with kids or animals (laughs) because it's it's tough it's hard it's you know you you get restricted hours with kids it's a tough way to make a, a film but if you have the right script and you have enough money and you can schedule it, it could be amazing. With animals, it's like animals can be unpredictable. So it's like, it's just hard to get... Most of the time they're unpredictable. Yeah, yeah it's hard to get <laughs> the performance you need out of them because it's, you know, you're communicating to a trainer or a wrangler and you're like, this is what I need. And they're just like trying to <laughs> get the animal to cooperate. A lot of films shape how we, you know, stories shape how we see the world, I believe. And a lot of the times films will come into the collective mind or the culture and it will change how we look at things. And I think about that when it comes to films with for kids and stuff as well, how how they see life and, and the stories that we tell shape our perception of life. Do you believe that as well, that our stories change how we see the world? And if so, what kind of stories do you feel you want to share with the younger minds of, of this world? There's two ways to look at it. For sure, certain films can shape the way that people look at it. I feel like documentaries do that the yeah. best. But I also think that a lot of people need kind of fantasy and escapism and surreal films as well that maybe aren't telling, you know, the best kind of like change the world storyline, but films are entertainment. And so people need those to escape the the realities of real life that's kind of why people started going to the cinemas so there's two ways of looking at it it's like yes i would love to to always make movies that will give a good perception and change people's attitudes i just don't think that's necessarily realistic to only make those types of films and maybe that's just for me you know harpoon is a dark comedy thriller Yeah, that is very gory. It's like, is that going to change the world? Absolutely not. But it will travel the world it already has, and people like seem to love it. Again, it's like it's in a way to escape and go watch a crazy, crazy mm-hmm. movie mm-hmm. and then be like, wow, that was like who came up with that idea and then we all look at <laughs> rob, rob and we all look at rob and like was it mike mike kovac wasn't he a writer on that as well uh he yeah he has like an additional uh, uh additional writing credit, credit yeah. yeah it's it's one of those things it's like documentaries though i find do that the for best. sure documentaries are huge with that and one of the things that i found recently uh in documentary I don't, you've watched a couple of vr documentaries haven't you no you haven't what i love about vr virtual reality and documentary is that they put you in those environments and they let you explore and look around while there's maybe a narration or something happening in front of you, but it allows the viewer to choose what they look at. And by doing so, it creates a connection to the material and to the content that I feel when you're watching a traditional documentary on TV and the director is saying, now we're going to look at this. Now we're going to look at that. We're going to close up on this person. It works, but by the user or the viewer being able to choose what they look at, the amount of information and how you can connect with the material, I feel is 10 times what a traditional documentary can do in terms of changing your perception. I watched one about uh, the prison system and some of the inmates and people in prison. I think it was in the United States. And you're just standing there and you're watching them interact with people that come into the prison and do, uh, I think it's like entrepreneurial skills uh, training or something like that. And you're watching them tell stories and talk about things. And you're like, I feel like I'm in the prison right now. I can look around at these people's faces. I can choose who I want to look at. And that deeply impacted me. I I know. So anyways, VR and documentary is, is like 
It's amazing. You got to check it out. Yeah, I think I haven't, I don't have too much experience with VR and documentaries, but I definitely think that VR will change the landscape. A couple of my friends, Combo Bravo is the company out of Toronto, are making these unreal VR projects. Some are documentaries, some aren't. And it's like they, they just won at Sidges a couple of years ago. They won Best VR Experience oh, cool. um, for their film Deerbrook. And it was a virtual reality thriller. But again, these are, these are guys uh, who travel the world making VR. And it's like I remember when they were in Africa filming. I can't, I can't remember the exact location, but they were filming with one of the governments there. Them burning millions of dollars worth of of ivory tusks oh, that yeah. they that they got and so they you know were there filming like a vr project and that right there is is so powerful for the world to see and for poachers to see and it's like these governments are willing to throw away and to burn millions of dollars because it's the right thing to do so like these guys at, at Combo Bravo are really doing like really cool projects and are, I think are kind of leading the VR scene, at least in Canada, yeah. if not if not the world. Yeah, I really agree with that point about documentary being probably one of the best vehicles to impact the social or the, the culture, you know, awareness around topics and around life and perspectives. I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite documentary? Ooh, I know you're talking about docs. Um, pop, pop, pop. I don't know if it's a documentary so much as it. Well, I guess it is, but it's it's a very. Have you ever seen that film, Sam Sarah, Samsara? Yes. Yeah, and the so, Bar Baraka, the one before that. So my f like favorite film, and I feel like we potentially. I don't know if we watched it at Cap, but we watched it in film school. Was Koyaanisqatsi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the same guys? Um, I don't know if it's the same. It's the guys, same idea, but it, yes, it's it's. Koina Scotsy was the first one. I think it came out in 79. Oh. Uh, and that was Francis Ford Coppola uh, executive produced that film. And I recently had the pleasure of watching it on the big screen in Toronto. Oh, awesome. A remastered version. And holy smokes, is that a cool experience. Seeing oh, it, wow. Seeing it in a, in a theater. It kind of started, you know, the dialogue lists beautiful films and images and just like how they're telling stories without dialogue, but with music, Philip Glass did the score to that. And like, holy yeah. smokes, the, the composition on that is like, I still just put on the soundtrack to it just because it's, it gives me chills. Yeah. Those films, like they mesmerize me and you just see life from the filmmakers POV. And it is so, mind altering in the way that you the perspectives that they they give you i feel that they don't try and push anything and ram it down your throat they just show life from all over the world and different things that are happening and they juxtapose it with other parts of the world uh and the music and such and that those films are really to me the most inspirational but documentaries they have that power and i think film does too but like you said i don't think it always has to be that's its primary thing. I just don't think it can. I, d I don't think it can always be, you know, for, for narrative films to be getting across a bigger message, unfortunately. And now with, you know, cameras being as small as they are, you know, you're, you can film a movie on your cell phone now. You just have a lot more people telling telling their stories. Yeah. I find that it would be difficult for everyone to be trying to like push a message and maybe there is small ones throughout films films can just follow one character's like life for yep. an hour for a day for a week you know and and it can all just be beautiful experience yeah yeah can you tell uh, do you have any stories where you you had a challenge in producing or even in any area of filmmaking where you know, it was, it was one of the best challenges that you overcame. Yeah. I think, you know, every film has its challenges. I, I want to say most of the challenges as a producer come to financing. 
other challenges which I haven't experienced but friends have is an actor either getting sick or mm. or something happens where an actor unfortunately has to to step down during production you know that becomes more of a, an insurance issue and then you have to figure out how you're going to reshoot what you've already shot so yeah there's just like there's a lot of big challenges but as a producer most of them come from financing you know on, on acquainted one of my last features we lost a large chunk of our financing day one of production Oof. an investor who was supposed to wire us money just decided that he was going to back out and you know it's one of those things where it's just like there's a bridge burned it's like we're never gonna yeah. go back to that guy again and trust that guy but it's like okay day one of filming it's like None of the producers were on set. We just kind of let, you know, our director do his thing that day. And all of us were around the corner in a coffee shop making phone calls and trying to close the financing. And by the end of that day, day one of filming, we had closed the financing, you know, which is there was a chance where we're like, oh, do we have to shut down like day one? It's like, do we have to pull the plug and like take our losses and and see if we can restructure it. But, you know, thankfully, Jonathan Keltz and Giacomo Giannotti and, and James O'Donnell are the producers on that, and, and Stephanie Sunny Hooker. We all came together and, and figured out a way to find that money that we were missing. So that's that's always a challenge for in, indie films is, is closing... Where's the money? Closing the financing, yeah. and it's like, you know, I, I do think in the next... It's already happening, but in the next like five years, with all the the, the streaming wars, I, I do f I hope that it'll get easier to make independent films, just because the streamers need more content, and I hope that they back more Canadian producers and directors. So you just mentioned uh, this this challenge about overcoming a finance gap. That was one of my questions for you. Was as a producer, I know a big part of your job is making sure all the money is in line. So. For people starting out in film, what do you recommend in terms of overcoming that challenge of finding enough money to make your film? When you're starting out in film, I would always recommend to write within your means because then it's easy to make and you don't need a lot of money. Keep your location simple. A lot of people's great first films are like three characters contained in one location. If you can do that, yeah, I think you have a better better chance of succeeding. A lot of A lot of writers write these elaborate I remember getting a script years ago that was as soon as I read it I was like this is probably like t upwards of 15 to 20 million dollars mm. it's like a big project there was lots of uh, boats and we were out at sea and there was like you know some pretty elaborate kind of war scenes and fighting as a first film it would be very hard to make. It's hard to finance a film because especially indie films, if you, if you don't have a name in it, you're probably going to lose money on the project if your budget's too big. So start small, like try to keep the budget as low yep. as possible. And that way you will, like I've, I've seen a lot of people do this really well. Like Jeremy Lalonde is a director in Toronto who has Indiegogo'd a lot of his projects either just for post-production funds to finalize the movie in post. But he has these group of fans that love his work. So he just crowdsources it. Yeah, but he, he says, also... Everybody give me 10 bucks. Yeah, but he also yeah. keeps it small. He understands, like, we're going to keep it in one location and we're going to, like, you know, he uses what's at his fingertips and he uses actors that love him and want to work with him because the writing's great, the comedy's hilarious. Um, he does a lot of, like, dark comedies... One of his movies is how to plan an orgy in a small town. And it is hilarious. <laughs> and again, it's like, you know, you'll notice most of these actors, they've been in lots of, uh, you know, Hollywood TV shows, Canadian TV shows. Yeah. So you'll notice them, but you know, they're, they're his friends as well. And so he can tap into that, that resource and be like, Hey, I have this fun part. If you're available, you should come work with me. And so that's the thing. It's like, he understands the challenges of financing and how to keep it small and contained and resourceful. It sounds to yeah. me is like how to use your resources best. And I think that's a great skill to develop because as you grow in budgets and the resources that you do have, 
you want to make sure that you're using them most efficiently. Totally. So you got to start somewhere and then use them the best you can. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's a saying in film, no matter how big your budget is, there's never enough money because, <laughs> because as the projects grow, it's like, there's just never enough money. So, so whether you have $500 or, you know, $55 million, it's like, have you ever not finished a project? Cause you ran out of money. No, um, I personally haven't. I've been on projects that lost a, a big chunk of financing again, like a week before production and, and we had to shut down, you know, we were gearing up, people were flying in, actors were supposed to fly in um, to this like remote location. And it's like, oh, we lost upwards of a couple hundred thousand. And it's like, okay, well, like we can't make the movie without it. So it's like you, we shut down, we canceled everyone's flights. We basically packed up and went home. And it's like, you know, when they picked up production again, they were able to you know, restructure the financing and figure out how to make it for the money they had. And they made a great film and, and they made it, I think like three months later, I wasn't available um, cause I already had another movie that was going after it. And so, you know, they just kind of picked up and did it and they, they ended up finishing the movie and it played a lot of festivals and, and all that. So it's like, I, I've never been a project that has been abandoned, which is great. Some of them might have like, Maybe should have <laughs> been abandoned, <laughs> yeah. but you know, most, most, I, I, I just, I'm kidding. There. <laughs> so what, uh, just, we're going to wrap up here. I just want to hear about some passion projects of yours or bucket list items in the future. What do you feel the time has come for Peter Harvey in your life? for you to what's emerging for you now what's what's coming up what's what's on the horizon so a new project that i'm currently developing is rules for werewolves and that's with uh jeremy shellin rayu who we went to film school with he was brought this project and the writer was a huge fan of of his work kirk lynn is the writer's name and he was a huge fan of jeremy's uh music videos that he did back in the day and kind of approached Jeremy and said, Jeremy, I have this book. He like cold called him and Jeremy's like, interesting. Like, who's this guy who's like Facebook messaging me um, and says he has a book. And, you know, Jeremy reached out and was like, okay, well, send me the book and sent him the book called Rules for Werewolves. And Jeremy read it and couldn't put it down. It was, it's an unbelievable read. And so the two of them, you know, developed the screenplay for Rules for Werewolves, the movie. And so... Jeremy and I were just at uh, the Frontiers Market at the Fantasia Film Festival this summer pitching the project, and we're hoping to be in production with it in fall of 2020. Awesome, man. I'm look, I look forward to that. I love the name, too. The title sounds great. And you, uh, you mentioned one of your goals about reading more. Yeah, I have a goal for 2020, which is to read at least a book a month. A so, book I wanna, a month. so I want to do 12 books next year. If I can do more... It would be amazing. I have a lot of books. I feel like I have a problem. I think I do too. I buy <laughs> so many books. And then, you know, I have a beautiful bookshelf with so many books and most of which I haven't read. So I'm just like, I'm trying to find a time, to like an hour a day where I can just like turn off my phone and just like read for an hour. Do you find that you read like the first 15, 20% of a book and then that's where you stop? Or do you feel like some books you haven't even opened? I, I would say I have like 10 on the go right now in, in various like, you know, page counts. Yeah. Some are upwards of 100. Some are like, yeah, within the 10, 10 to 20 realm. I try, I'm trying to kind of like finish a book one at a time now or at least have just like two on the go just so you don't get the storylines mixed up. But yeah, it's, I, I, I would say majority of the ones on my bookshelf I haven't opened. Well, next time I have you on here, we'll have to touch base about your your 2020 goal. See how you're doing with your book reading. Are you going to take that speed reading course that I was telling you about? I know. Graham's been <laughs> pitching me the speed reading course. And yes, I am. You uh, got to do it. It's great. I know. I know. Yeah. And then I'll, maybe I'll, be, I'll come back and I'll be like, I did 24 books. <laughs> okay. So last question. This is a fun question that I came up with. Uh, while I was on set years ago, probably about eight years ago, and uh, I was just sitting around on set. You got a lot of time waiting around. You got a lot of time uh, between you know, setups or whatever. This question just came to my mind as something fun. But what I found is it's really interesting and it, it's um, kind of cool to learn a bit about people and what drives them or what really 
inspires them, uh, they connect deepest with. So the question goes like this. You've heard it before, but I'm going to say it again for the audience. If you had a magic painting, or it could even be a magic motorcycle or some sort of magic memento of some sort, that whenever you looked at it or you rode this motorcycle, you could feel any feeling you wanted to feel to any degree that you wanted to feel it. What feeling would you choose? And what color would you have on the painting or the color of the bike or object or whatever that you would want to represent that for you? So, yeah, that's it's a really good question. Um, I would probably pick gratefulness or like and if, I guess gratefulness kind of uh, merges into like happiness, but more so from, you know, I always feel so grateful from you know, the experiences that I've had and watching, especially watching like my friends succeed. And just, I feel like growing up in the film industry and coming up the last like 10 years, you're competing a lot for the same funding as your friends. And I've learned that you just need to be, you know, if you don't necessarily get the funding you're looking for, but your friends do, you need to be grateful and happy and just like, I love that feeling of supporting Mm. and just like, and trying to grow this, like this amazing film community that we have in Canada. So it's like, it's a form of happiness, I guess is is ultimately the, the answer to it. That's beautiful. And it's also being supportive of those people. Yeah. Because it's very easy to fall unconscious into that jealousy or that resentment, you know, maybe you, you missed out. Totally. But it's like, you know, I tell a lot of young filmmakers this, it's like, it's a long, you know, it's a long career. It's a long life. And it's like, you might as well be supporting your friends wins and keep following your dreams as well. And if you have this kind of ecosystem of support and, you know, happiness for everyone coming up at the same time and succeeding, you're going to have this beautiful film Mm. film community who Mm. who likes to and that's what i feel so grateful about in toronto is it's like we have a really beautiful film community there where everyone kind of supports everyone and and you know goes out and watches their films and and you know will will repost and tweet and put up on instagram their their friends successes and their friends triumphs and it's it's just like a really beautiful thing and i feel very grateful that i'm a part of that and also it makes me extremely happy yeah it's a good feeling yeah so it's like i love that that feeling of just being like okay we're all in this together yeah we we got this let's keep moving forward and so like for me it's like i would have a a picture of either one of my like film sets like a behind the scenes shot of the cameras rolling or one of my friends cool man is there, are there colors that come to mind for this feeling for you? Like if you were to associate colors with it? Um, I think it would just be like a vibrant 35 millimeter shot. Of, <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like 35 millimeter, like I know color film is just yeah. so vibrant and beautiful and just like makes me so happy. So that's, I, I think they're very would, rich colors. Yeah. They're yeah. super rich and they're just like, you can't, fake that with digital and so yeah i think it would just be a very like beautiful 35 mil blown up oh nice print of these vibrant real life colors because you never can really fake what your eye sees yeah and yeah cool and just to to the last little bit on this question if you were to try and explain this feeling of gratitude uh, of happiness to somebody who had never felt that before in their body how would you try and explain it to them I would say it's like a a warmness that's in like the core of your body. And it's just like a feeling of relief and just, and beauty. Relief. Interesting. Yeah. There's a relief to it. Yeah. You're just kind of like, you're, I guess you're relieved that, that somebody is succeeding. Mm. I guess it's like, it also is a form of hope. Oh, okay. Because it's like if it, you know you're watching your friend succeed, you're like, okay, it can be done. I can do this too. Oh, Let's do this. And wow. you're like, so it's, inspir- it's inspiring as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah. I feel like that's the the probably the biggest catalyst behind this all is the inspiration that wow you and your friends give each other. Oh, and you're just like okay. beautiful. Yeah, 
Wow. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You drill into this and I can feel it so much more now. And I feel like that's such a, such a great thing to share with people is to like share with them what feeling lights you up the most and explain it to people. Cause as you're telling me, I'm going, that's amazing. I can feel that now. That's amazing. I love that feeling. Yeah. It's the best. Yeah. So that's, that's why I'm like, <laughs> you know, I, I love, uh, love supporting my friends and watching all their movies because it, inspires me and makes me feel grateful to make my own films and to go after yeah. that. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Peter, for supporting me and being on my first episode of my podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming out. Well, thank you so much for having me. Awesome, Peter. Okay. Uh, for everyone who wants to check out Peter's work and follow him, he has Instagram. You have Twitter too, don't you? Yeah. You're a Twitter guy. You're on Facebook. Yep. Yep. He's all over that. So we'll put that, all those links in the show notes. Thanks for listening guys. And we'll talk to you next time. Cheers. Well, that was a lot of fun for me. I enjoyed having Peter on the podcast. And I just want to let you know before you go that the intro music was provided by Eskimotion. In the intro of the episode there, that song is called In Dreams, and the artist is Eskimotion. So if you want to check him out and listen to any more of his music, you can go on your favorite uh, streaming platform and just type in Eskimotion, E-S-K-I-M-O-T-I-O-N, Eskimotion, to see more or hear more, I should say, of his music. Also, I want to tell you a bit about uh, a coupon code that I got lined up for my favorite boxers. They block over 99% of electromagnetic fields, you know, from your cell phone, a Wi-Fi router, your laptop, or whatever. Uh, and they protect your little warriors down there uh, from <laughs> being damaged. Uh, there's a bunch of studies in science on the website, getlambs.com. So you can check out those studies there and check out their products. They're coming out with a line of women's underwear as well to protect women from these uh, fields, these electromagnetic fields that do some damage to our health. So you can protect yourself by going to getlambs.com and using the promo code time has come and you'll get 15% off your purchase and you can use it multiple times. So if you want to buy more stuff, you use it again, get another 15% off. Now, if you go on the website, you will see that they offer 15% off if you enter your email and give them that information. So I'm not saying that I have a special deal lined up with them. What I am saying is that if you do use my promo code, you can help out the show, and I would be most grateful for that. So if you want to check out the science and the research and the great products that they have, you can go to getlambs.com and enter the promo code Time Has Come, the name of the podcast. No the, just Time Has Come, and you'll get 15% off, and you'll have to show up. So I appreciate that. All the best to everyone. Thank you so much. I wish you a healthy, happy, an adventurous life. Cheers.